Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive once again starting at Moto Ferry Bridge with an i4 this time around, fresh into stock. And given it's the first one we have in stock, I thought I would take you around it, show you all the things you need to know from someone who sells a lot of BMW i products. Yes, let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. It is directly competing with something like a Tesla Model 3 or the Polestar 2, both of which we really, really like. So the bar is definitely set high. The second thing we need to be clear about is the fact that this is not built on a bespoke EV architecture. So if I pop the bonnet, there is absolutely no storage space underneath here, unfortunately. Of course, with this particular version, having the M badges dotted all over the place, it is the M50, which is the highest drivetrain specification, which means all-wheel drive. So one of the motors is indeed living underneath all of that space, but I'm sure BMW could have squeezed it a franc if they tried, because there should be just enough room, but I will not take all of this off until I get to the office. What is the saving grace is the situation in the boot, because unlike the Model 3 and just like the Polestar 2, it has a lift back or a hatchback opening, which is very popular here in Europe. And obviously it makes a lot of sense if you need to carry bigger items. The opening is absolutely huge. So even something like a mountain bike should fit. You've got 40, 20, 40 split folding seats and this very interesting partial shelf, which I have not seen on any other vehicle yet. So it's all a hard material, but it's split into two and the second section lifts with the actual tailgate itself which makes it nice and easy to get into the car because you don't have to open anything manually and when that closes it should mean that all of the noise from the rear wheel arches should stay isolated in the back and you basically get the refinement of a saloon. In terms of additional practicality you've got mounting points for roof racks and optionally these could be fitted with an electrically retractable tow hitch but forget practicality just Look at the design. It's probably the looks which is actually the biggest benefit of sharing the architecture with the petrol and diesel 4 series Grand Coupe because it just happens to look like a normal BMW, only electric. Even though, yes, I appreciate that this massive front grille is a little bit marmite and it's obviously completely blanked off on this electric version because you only need a little bit of cooling down here at the bottom for the battery and the power electronics. I already had a couple of people come up to it when I had the bonnet open asking what's actually underneath, what's the engine? And they were a bit shocked to hear it was electric. So if this is what it takes to get people to switch to electric, especially car enthusiasts, then so be it. Because this does have a fantastic long hood which could easily house a V8 and a cabin which is quite swept back compared to especially something like the Model 3 which almost feels like an inflated bubble. Unfortunately there is no way around it, that means that the rear seat space is a little bit compromised. I'm about six foot tall and you can see that if I sit up straight I have just about enough headroom and with the front seat set to my usual comfortable driving position also just about enough knee room and of course there's also a transmission tunnel here even though there's no transmission because of the ICE architecture. Look, kids are going to be completely fine here and even four adults once in a while are going to be comfortable but if you are planning to fully load the car very often then I would recommend looking at something like the iX3 if you want to stay within the BMW family. That's enough of the boring stuff, let's get to the fun stuff, which is driving. So, to turn the vehicle on, you still have a traditional start-stop button in the center console. And I don't know how that came across on the mic and the camera, but I have kept the iconic sport sounds, or whatever it's called, on. I will turn up the temperature to 20 degrees, everything is in automatic. Yes, I'm afraid, unlike the iX3 and the i3, all the climate controls are in the touchscreen, but it's a very responsive touchscreen. We will get onto that in just a second as well. Speaking of the tech, let's try the voice control so we can see how intuitive that is. Hey BMW, navigate to Wisely Automotive. It found the correct address. It's calculating the route. It's automatically suggesting it's automatically suggesting that I need to stop to charge. So yeah, this is very nice and easy. And it has also done the same thing as an i3, where it now recalculated the remaining mileage in the battery 
based on the root profile. So this is all fantastic, love to see this. And if I look at the root overview, I get all the details showing that I need to reach Ionity with 29%, I will get up to 51% in 11 minutes, and then I can continue to our final destination, which is our showroom in London. Happy with that, I can leave that running, and I will also make sure to reset the trip computer so we can measure the efficiency. I'm starting off, let's go into comfort mode. A1M, one of my favorite routes, plenty of charging alongside here. Feel free to check out the dedicated video we have done on that. But going back to the i4, obviously many reviewers have already gone over it in great detail and we are not professionals, but I still want to touch on a couple of things because specifically the M50 differs to the other version of the i4 in terms of the chassis and the drivetrain technology. As already mentioned, it is an all-wheel drive system consisting of two electric motors, but it's the chassis which is quite unique to the M50. So normally you get the i4 on coal springs and normal dumpers all around, whereas here, to make it feel a little bit more sporty without a compromise on comfort, you've got an air spring or air suspension set up across the rear axle, but the front is normal coil springs. And on top of that, to be able to customize the feel, you get adaptive dampers all around. Lastly, it also comes with sport variable steering, which means that at lower speeds, the steering ratio is quicker to aid with maneuvering, and at high speeds, the steering is a little bit more stable feeling. I was a bit skeptical about this at first, because I remember back in the day, we used to own a BMW X5 at home, and it was the first generation of that technology and it wasn't very good, but this instantly, after just driving it a few miles, feels a lot better, but I will reserve my final judgment for when we get to the office. What you probably care about more if you are watching our channel is the electric side of things, and it is quite well done. So now we are crawling basically in stop and go traffic, and the accelerator pedal is very smooth, and so are the brakes. The brakes are very important because it's a blended brake system, meaning when you touch the brake pedal, it's the computer deciding how much region to apply versus physical friction brakes. And here it's done very well, it's very predictable, I can come to a complete stop smoothly without making my passengers sick. I'm in the default mode, which means in drive, and I've left the car in factory settings, which means that it's in adaptive region. So it's using the radar and the camera to detect the traffic situation ahead and based on that apply region if there are slow vehicles ahead. Whereas for example, in an opposite scenario, if you're alone on the motorway and you let go of the accelerator pedal, just rest your foot, it will keep on coasting. If you don't like it, to be fair, I'm not the biggest fan of it because sometimes, for example, if you come into a roundabout, the car thinks that the road ahead is clear, but you actually want to slow down to give way. You can change it in the My Vehicle menu. It's a little bit hidden away. Maybe there's a better way of accessing it, but you basically go into the Drive Settings, Drivetrain and Chassis, Energy Recovery in Drive, and you can choose it to whatever you prefer. So for example, I can go into Low. It's highlighted in the Instrument Cluster. I'm not sure whether that's visible on this camera, so let me try to bring it in a little bit and hopefully that helps. Yes, yeah, so you've got only one arrow pointing down and then it feels basically like a normal traditional old school automatic. You can also see that we are creeping forward. The moment I let go of the brake pedal, creep is on. You can go about disabling creep in two ways. So you can enable auto hold and there's a shortcut for that right in the instrument panel here in the middle. And that means that creep is still on, but if we come to a complete stop, like for example now, and I press the brake in, the auto hold symbol pops up in the dash and I don't have to touch the pedals. But I had to touch the brake pedal in the first place to come to a stop. Alternative method is disabling auto hold and flicking the gear selector into B mode. So this is where normally you would have a sport mode on old school internal combustion engine BMWs. And initially it feels identical, but now if I let go of the accelerator pedal, we get maximum region, regardless of what setting you have in the D mode. And we will come to a complete stop and the car, I think it holds the brakes or it uses the motors to stand still, but it's absolutely rock solid. So basically like an i3 with one pedal driving, but even slightly better because it works quite well even on downhills, whereas the i3, it will keep rolling down a hill at 
couple of miles per hour. I like region, so I will leave it in B mode for now. And yeah, I'm still in comfort. I'm literally doing five miles per hour, not that it would make much of a difference. Speaking of which, this presents a good opportunity to test out the driving assistance technology. You do have adaptive cruise control, but word of warning, it's not standard on all i4s. And in fact, I believe there was a supply shortage for some of the adaptive cruise control parts. So some of them where you may have expected them to be fitted with the adaptive cruise actually didn't have it at all. So just make sure that you double check with the person you are buying the car from that it has the equipment you want. Obviously, if you're buying from us, we are a specialist, a low volume seller. So we really know our stock train through. So if you ask any questions, we will be able to give you the answers. To enable it, you press this button on the steering wheel and you see you get a pop-up in the instrument cluster saying the distance control is now activated. It has also been set to the lowest possible speed, which is 20 miles per hour, but it knows that we are in a 40 mile per hour section, so I can just click set for it to accept the current speed limit. Nice and simple. Obviously, I'm still doing the steering completely on my own. If I wanted to do the lane centering as well, I can click the mode button on the steering wheel and that brings us into the assisted driving mode. This car is equipped with the driving assistant professional, which is the highest tier of driving assistance you can get on these i4s. I don't know whether it will come across on any of these cameras, but there is a little cutout in the instrument cluster and that's for a camera, I believe, which should be looking at my eyes to make sure that I'm looking at the road. But for better or for worse, you still need to have your hands on the steering wheel from time to time to let the car know that you are actually responsible and paying attention. To see what the system is doing behind the scenes, we can change the instrument cluster view into the ADAS view. And now this looks very similar to something like, for example, Tesla Autopilot, where you can see that the system is correctly identifying both lanes because those are highlighted in green and that it's tracking the vehicle ahead of us because that's highlighted in a green box. But it also recognizes the traffic in the lanes next to us. Just for demonstration purposes, you can see that at these low speeds, I will keep my hands near the steering wheel, but off it. And yes, it is doing the steering on its own to stay actively in the middle of the lane. This is not ping-ponging from side to side. That's just lane departure warning. This is proper lane centering. I have to say I'm very impressed. It is very smooth with all of this low speed crawling. This is where some adaptive cruise control systems suffer. And in fact, I would say it's the Tesla Autopilot, which is quite aggressive. I know people in the past used to complain that it leaves too big of a gap. So Tesla made it really aggressive, but they almost overcorrect it. But even the cones on the side don't freak it out. What about now? So we lose the lane lines. It's a bit close for comfort to the central reservation, but it's doing it. Now we have cars merging. So the car, the i4 has recognized that, as you can see in the display view here, and it has correctly locked on to the Citroen, but without any panic, no slamming on the brakes. It smoothly adjusted the following distance to keep enough of a gap. It doesn't have automatic lane changes, but when you turn on the turn signal, it will let go of the steering until you move into the new lane. It's maintaining the speed on its own. And then once you are in the new lane and you turn off the turn signal, it automatically locks on. You do not have to re-engage it again. It's interesting because it's like it first recognizes the lane, but it takes a couple of seconds for it to lock on. The Polestar system is a little bit quicker, but I think this is all on purpose. And you can see the vehicles even when they are by my side. I assume it's using the radar for that. Really well done and smoothly matches the speed of that Audi. So even though there was a car passing me, I could feel the i4 starting to accelerate, but it doesn't accelerate more than it needs to. It's just enough to match the flow of traffic. Really, I mean, this is about as good as it gets, especially for a legacy automaker. Well done. Also, I don't know whether this comes across on camera, but the refinement is absolutely fantastic. To again reference the Model 3 and the Polestar 2, 
those two cars are definitely louder than this. Granted, for the M50 configuration, this one is quite optimal because it's on the 19-inch wheels. If you really want the absolute most hardcore performance, you can specify stronger performance brakes, but because the rotors and the calipers are bigger, they do not fit underneath the 19-inch alloys. So you need to specify 20-inch wheels and they do kill quite a bit of range. And obviously I'm assuming they will also translate to a little bit more road noise and less comfort. So I'm quite happy with this situation as it is. And in fact, I will drop the car down into Eco Pro mode now just to squeeze out the maximum efficiency so we can judge what kind of real-world range to expect with this all-wheel drive system and the quite reasonably big battery pack. Okay, I am cheating a little bit. I've come off the A1M because I want to see what this car is actually like on the back roads. You know, I am not doing this because I want to have fun. This is definitely for science and for being able to advise our customers what the car is like when you push it a little bit more. So in comfort mode so far, very refined, very predictable. Around these bends, I'm doing 60 miles per hour, which is the speed limit here, and it just takes it no problem. It's like it's stuck on rails. The road is quite bad here with quite a few potholes which have not been quite filled in properly, and I can barely feel them. I'm really, really impressed. The suspension, obviously, is one of the things which BMW knows how to do but it is absolutely fantastic. But it was enough of comfort mode, let's go into sport mode. My heads-up display has changed the look, the instrument cluster has changed, it has gone all red, and I can feel a massive difference. You know, sometimes people say that adaptive dampers and all of these things are just a massive gimmick. Look, you can be blindfolded and you will be able to tell the difference in the i4. Like, I can feel every single thing in the road now. Whereas in comfort mode, yes, you can feel the things, but it's just floating over the bumps. Yeah, if someone is skeptical about all the modern tech to make cars handle better, they need to try out this thing. So let's see, we are going right. I just put some random street in the middle of nowhere into the Satnav as an intermediate destination. So we will see where we get to. As I mentioned, I've got the iconic sounds on. So in comfort, they are there, but they are quite subtle. In sport mode, they get quite a bit louder, but in Eco Pro, the car goes quiet. And to be fair, that's a nice setup. And as we are about to get out of the village onto the national speed limit section of these winding roads, I will pop the car into sport. And actually, let's just launch it from 30 to 60. Yeah, it's quick and it's a lot more kind of vicious than the Model 3. The Model 3 is a very clean car and it almost, I think that's why some people say that it lacks character. Whereas this, I think BMW knows how to do traction control. They've done a perfect job with the i3 and even the Mini Electric, which is front wheel drive, is very well controlled. Whereas here, I think it's almost like they intentionally give it a little bit too much torque and it scrambles on purpose to make it a little bit more fun. So let's see. I don't want to overcook it into these corners, but yeah, I mean, this will handle more than anything you can throw at it in day-to-day -day use. The brakes are good as well. I'm in the high region mode now. The steering is also noticeably heavier in sport mode. You know, and it's not all about outright or straight line performance. What about these twisties? Yep, I mean, if you need it to go, it does go. I'm struggling the lane here because the edges are a little bit worn out. There's lots of potholes, but I've got nobody around me. I'm very vigilant. Obviously, I'm not pushing it to the limit. I don't know the car that well. The problem is it's too good. In these winding stretches, even with the undulations, it just feels like you're doing a comfortable speed. This car is not being pushed to the limit whatsoever. Yeah, and obviously I don't want to push it past the speed limit. It's, it far exceeds what most people need it to do. But on the other hand, if you want a car which is fun to drive and not just fast, but also fun, I think this is the choice out of the Polestar and the Tesla. And let's see, we've got nobody around us. So let's try to do a launch control. You're in sport mode. So can I do left foot on the brake? Power. Oh yeah, that is vicious, I, but I like it. 
you see everybody is driving in the middle it's just how you do it on these roads also one other good thing is that the lane keeping assistant is on you can see the icon keeps flicking on and off as it detects the lane markings but even if i go through the middle here to avoid some of the potholes it's fine it doesn't complain really at least in sport mode i think it may be tuned differently for the other driving modes let's see if i put a bit of steering lock in it still pulls beautifully these electric cars they are just very good at delivering just the amount of power you need without being uncontrollable and that's what some people say is a bit too boring and clinical but if you are not a professional driver and you just want to have a bit of fun this is the safe way to do it i rejoined the a1 let the computer do most of the driving and given i still have plenty of charge i settle in for a comfortable journey As you may have noticed, I ditched the Satnav charging plan and I ended up at Ionity Cambridge, still with about 16% in the battery, a few miles, well, 48 miles. I'm not used to this coming from the i3. So let's plug in and let's see what charging speed we get. Ramping up and almost the maximum of 200 kilowatts didn't expect anything different i've been driving for a while so i'm sure that the battery is completely up to temperature and to be fair that's one of the reasons why i postponed the charging stop because i wanted to show you the maximum charging power from this low state of charge even though i was absolutely bursting for the bathroom also can i just say that this interface is absolutely fantastic because it shows you everything you need to know without being overwhelming so firstly it shows that we are charging to 100 percent even though we don't need to so i will unplug probably at 50 percent what charging power we are getting, what's the maximum and how far down we have come. I can see the exact percentage, what that translates to miles, and I can see how many miles we will have at full state of charge. To be fair, all of it is quite intuitive. The looks, I will be honest, are not quite to my liking. There's a lot of kind of goldish colors. I would much prefer monochrome look, but as you can see, I've logged in with my BMW ID, which means that all of the settings I have adjusted are now saved to my profile. And the system just does everything you would expect it to do. So as discussed, it can easily find points of interest without you having to know the full address. It calculates the state of charge. On arrival, it's quite intuitive. The screen is very responsive, bright, good colors. So yeah, while it's not Android Automotive or the Tesla system, I was pleasantly surprised to see how far iDrive has come. Where BMW absolutely went to town is on customization. Like, for example, show me which other car gives you three different sport modes. On top of that, if I go into Eco Pro, two different eco modes and you can customize it to your liking exactly how you want the car to behave by the way yes i've moved from the charger because i'm already at 51 percent but yeah we could spend an entire day going through all of these options because not only can you customize your home screen you can also have your custom shortcuts you've got a list of frequently used things here in the climate menu even though yes it is all touch based if I turn the climate on, you will see that when we are in automatic, this changes how the automatic setting behaves. Whereas if I turn off auto, then you have got manual heated seats. Honestly, just let us know whether you would like to see more about this system, because many people have already done it before. But if so, I'm sure we can make a dedicated hour-long video for all the nerds out there. If I fire up the car, keep in mind that so far I've only focused on the central display, but there's also the instrument cluster, which is much more customizable than previous generations of the BMW systems. Some of the layout is tied to the driving mode, so now we are in Eco Pro, but if you switch to Comfort, then you get most customizability. You just need to press this button on the steering wheel, which brings up a menu in the instrument cluster, and then you are using the rocker switch to move through the different options here. So firstly, you can display different content in the middle section of the screen. So for example, you can have your map, your RO view, your media information, and so on. I've had it mostly on the assisted driving view so I can see what the car is doing. And then here, you can then change the layout. So you have got this narrow view or more traditional gauges, or lastly, this kind of expanded content view. If you look closely, you can see that you can move one level over to the right as well. 
and you can then customize what you see in the head-up display. So you either see just your basic information like speed and speed limit, or your full navigation data, your sport instrument display, or you've got a reduced view with a bit of everything. The wide angle camera is coming in handy. That's part of the parking assistance package. We will touch on that at the end of the video, but to be fair, I'm quite close to base now. Yeah, the acceleration of electric cars never gets old and that wasn't full power, not remotely. I also really like the sound. I know some people say it's a gimmick, but I think it enhances the experience and in this case it is quite well matched to the character of the car. It's not trying to be a V8, it's just its own thing and, you know, it was composed by Hans Zimmer, supposedly. And yeah, if you're into your movies, you probably know that if Hans Zimmer was involved, it better be good. But back into Eco and driver assist on. You've already seen all of this autopilot-ish view, but what I haven't shown you, what I see in the head-up display, is how the sat-nav is actually directing me. Because if we go into the map, I will just turn off the heads-up display for now. And you can hopefully see that it's showing me exactly which lane to be in and which lane I am in. I know quite a few cars can do this now, mostly the Germans. I have no idea how it works, whether it's high precision GPS or whether it uses other data from, for example, the onboard camera to localize itself. But for example, now it knows that I'm in lane two. It's telling me I should be in the right three lanes. And if I move over into lane three, it knows I'm in lane three. And if I move over one more, it knows I'm in lane four. How fantastic is that? No more excuses for taking the wrong junction of the motorway. And even in these steeper curves, you can see that the car is handling the bends without any problem. Oh, by the way, it's now very clear to see these lights at night. You may not have noticed those during the day. It's if you do not have your hands on the wheel for a period of time or the car thinks that you are inattentive using the driver facing camera, it will initially give you just a visual warning using those lights. So it very clearly gets your attention and it's a capacitive steering wheel, meaning you don't have to put in any torque to let the car know that you are paying attention. Literally just the lightest touch, two fingers, that's enough to let it know that you are still awake. You see that EQE cutting in front of us and even though I was ready on the brakes, I did not need to intervene. The car slowed down on its own and without panic. That's also important. Back in the day, adaptive cruise control systems in these traffic situations in the city, if someone cut in in front of you, it would just slam on the brakes because it would realize that suddenly there is not enough of a gap. But this I4 adjusted beautifully like I would if I was driving on my own. I'm also getting speed camera notifications in the head-up display. Of course, I would not advise to rely on 100% and you shouldn't be speeding in the first place, but you saw that there was a speed camera there. So having this much information, but spread out over the three different screens, you know, the physical middle screen, the actual instrument cluster and the head-up display, it's very easy to be aware of what's happening without information overload. And we are about to enter a roundabout which the iForce driver assistant can't do, so I will just do this manually from now on. In some countries, I believe, with the driving assistant professional, it is actually capable of stopping for traffic lights, but it's a completely different implementation to how Tesla Autopilot works, because Teslas, as you probably know, rely completely on camera vision, whereas BMW, I suppose, are trying to be a bit more cautious and they're relying on smart traffic lights, so the infrastructure needs to be in place for the car to be able to stop for said traffic lights. Some major cities, I think like Frankfurt, possibly in Germany, they do have uh, those traffic lights. Not in the UK, as far as I know. And even on the section of the A13 with no right-hand side road marking, only a curb and the other lane line, the car is handling this very, very smoothly. It is letting me know that we are in an average speed check zone. And unfortunately, this section of the A13 is notorious for people hogging the middle lane. It is kind of understandable because the leftmost lane often splits off uh, and turns into the exit lane. But let's see in this scenario, will the I4 undertake? Yes, it would. 
I will in this case move over. But that's interesting because, for example, it's a very European way of doing things because on the motorway it would never undertake. It would actually highlight the other car in the green box as well. So the driver knows that the i4 is slowing down because of not undertaking a vehicle. And here I pressed set and it took over the 30 mile per hour speed limit before we pass the 30 gate. This is very slow and we'll probably get beeped at, but you know, this is the way you should drive in London. Now it knows that in 250 yards, it will be increasing up to 40. And if I click, I can't click set yet, but I can click set now. And we are moving up to 40 as soon as we pass the gate. I'm in the showroom now and I promised I would demonstrate the 360 degree camera which comes as part of the parking assistant package because at least in my eyes is the best 360 degree camera out of any auto manufacturer. Firstly the image is quite crisp and as you can see the data from the ultrasonic sensors is overlaid into the actual video feed and you also get guidance lines to help you when you are parking and when you get close to something like for example this Polestar the angle automatically switches to a top-down view so I can fine-tune how close I get without crashing into it. But let me actually position the vehicle into our showroom here. And it's not just the camera but also the ultrasonic sensors on these BMWs are very accurate. And if you're very careful and technical you may see that sometimes the stitch line along the cameras moves because these cameras, as you may have seen, it just happened there to minimize the distortion you can see so if you are very close to the wall it keeps flicking back and forth to make sure that you get an accurate representation of all the angles when they are stitched together and you will not accidentally hit something and when you go into park it overlays the graphic of the doors so you know how much space you have to swing those open the vehicle is now fully prepared nicely detailed so let's run through the journey stats because i did take some notes over the 196 miles, it averaged 3.3 miles per kilowatt hour, which I think is pretty respectable considering I was mostly driving at 70 on the motorways and I also had a little bit of fun in sport mode on the country roads. That means that even after the very brief Ionity charging session, I arrived here into the showroom with still about a quarter of the battery left. What does that translate to in terms of costs though? I did a lot of number crunching and assuming that I started with the 68% in the battery which were charged at home and then topped up just enough at Ionity to make it here, it works out to less than 10 pence per mile, which I would say is pretty impressive for a mixed use case scenario and particularly so in a 540 horsepower all-wheel drive almost performance car. And honestly, it quite closely aligns with what we see people get in general as a average of public charging and home charging if they run an EV on longer journeys as well. Obviously, if you exclusively charge at public chargers, it will be a little bit more. And if you have the opportunity to charge at home on off-peak electricity, it will be even less. To put that into context, if you were driving a petrol vehicle on this same route and you wanted to match the running costs, it would need to achieve 16 miles per gallon, which again, considering the performance level of this car is quite impressive. Speaking of which, let's discuss the car itself because it's not all about the cost. At the end of the day, this is a BMW and honestly, it does feel like a proper BMW despite it being electric. The build quality is absolutely fantastic. It's very solid. It drives nicely. The seats are comfortable yet very supportive. But at the same time, if you don't want to drive yourself, the technology is very impressive and particularly the driving assistant professional did a very good job and I haven't had a single phantom brake on the entire journey down here which means that yes, it's maybe not as overhyped as Tesla's autopilot, but in practice it works really, really well. Where's the catch then? Well, I will be honest, obviously we are selling these cars, but it's the price, because compared to the competitors, which are the Polestar 2 and the Tesla Model 3, the BMW i4 definitely carries a little bit of a premium. So I would say it's only up to you to decide whether it's worth paying for the badge and what it carries with it, because at the end of the day, the Model 3 and the Polestar 2 are also fantastic options with very similar range, but different pros and cons. 
And on that topic, I would like to, to thank you for watching this video if you made it all the way to the end. Definitely make sure to subscribe if you want to see more EV content and also make sure to check out our Polestar 2 video if you want to see how that car stacks up in the real world. Thanks again and see you in the next one.